Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Chen Zheng Li, and I am honored to be invited here. Today, my lecture is about multimodality imaging in valvular heart disease. And it's a rather broad theme, and I am going to focus mainly on aortic stenosis, in which multimodality imaging has an important role. While echocardiography is the cornerstone of diagnosis and follow-up in valvular heart disease, uh, other imaging modalities can also provide complementary and, and additional information. And today, I am going to talk about that. This is the contents of my talk. I am going to talk about the diagnosis, progression, risk stratification, the detection of comorbid disease, and planning TAVI in severe AS, and then touch on the use of CMR in valvular regurgitation. First of all, as you well know, there is often a discrepancy of echocardiography parameters for grading the severity of aortic stenosis. While the pressure gradient is inversely proportional to valve area, there is a gray zone in which patients have a valve area of under one square centimeter, but a mean pressure gradient under 40 millimeter mercury. And these patients can be classified as low flow, low gradient, severe AS. The American guidelines of divide, further divide symptomatic severe AS into classical high gradient severe AS and low flow low gradient severe AS. The low gradient is due to low flow through the valve and thus the term low flow low gradient AS. Low flow can be caused by two reasons. The first is reduced LV ejection fraction and the second is low stroke volume due to a small LV chamber. This latter is called paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS with a normal LV ejection fraction. And this is often confusing to diagnose in the clinical setting. And this is a diagram of, uh, this is a diagram of normal severe AS. While this is a diagram of a paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS with a small LV chamber. This is the European guideline for di diagnosing severe AS. If there is a high grade gradient, which is not secondary to a high flow status, then no problem, severe AS can be diagnosed. However, if there is a low gradient with a Vmax of under four meter per second and a mean pressure gradient of under 40 millimeter mercury, although the AV area is under one square centimeter, it is difficult to decide whether the patient has severe AS or not. In this case, First, whether the low gradient is due to a low flow should be assessed. In the routine echocardiography exam, this can be calculated with the LVOT Doppler. If the stroke, stroke volume index is greater than 35 millimeters per meter square, then severe AS is unlikely. However, if the stroke index is less than 35 and the low flow is due to reduced LV ejection fraction, then a dobutamin stress echocardiography should be done. If there is low flow, but the LV ejection fraction is normal, then many other clinical and imaging data can be checked to see whether they fit the paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS picture. In this case, an important additional imaging modality is the AV calcium score by CT. So these two are the important additional imaging modalities to make the diagnosis of severe AS in the context of low flow, low gradient AS. The dobutamin stress echocardiography should be done for low flow, low gradient AS due to reduced LV ejection fraction to, to check whether an increase in stroke volume results in greater opening of the aortic valve. If the aortic valve stays below one square centimeter, even though the AV Vmax increases to over four meter per second, then the patient can be diagnosed with severe AS. However, if there is no flow reserve and AV Vmax does not increase despite the administration of dobutamin, then it is difficult to make a diagnosis. In this case, and in the case of paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS with preserved LV ejection fraction, the AV calcium score by non-contrast CT is useful. Advanced calcification strongly suggests severe AS. There are gender-specific cutoffs for diagnosing severe AS. As stenosis plays a greater role in women, the cutoff value for calcification is lower in women.
The AV calcium score also strongly predicts future hemodynamic progression and has an independent prognostic value over echocardiography. This is an example of AV calcium scoring by non-contrast CT. The first patient has mild AV calcification and an AV calcium score of 200 at Gaston units. On the other hand, the, the third patient has severe AV calcification with an AV calcium score of 2,000 agastin units, which is above the threshold for severe AS. Severe a AV calcification was also independently predictive of death and AV replacement in patients with AS. Next, the PETs may have a role for predicting AS progression. Radio-labeled sodium fluoride has a strong affinity to microcalcification and thus can be used to measure calcific activity even in the absence of visible calcification on standard CT. Thus, the sodium fluoride PET visualizes areas of valve degeneration which are predisposed to progression to calcific stenosis. In this figure, you can see intense sodium fluoride uptake which are adjacent to the to the pre-existing calcification of the aortic valve. And one year later on a follow-up CT, you can see that extensive further calcification has developed in the areas of strong sodium fluoride uptake in the baseline PET. Currently, the PET CT is mostly used for research purposes, but in the future, it may have a role in identifying patients at risk and also targets for novel drugs. Uh, next, currently, the only treatment for aortic stenosis is aortic valve replacement, and thus the timing of intervention is a very important decision. In the latest guidelines, the timing of intervention is, li is largely guided by the development of symptoms or the reduction of LV ejection fraction to below 50%. Otherwise, AV repl replacement can be considered in asymptomatic patients with abnormal exercise result tests or very severe AS or rapid disease progression, but these recommendations come with a lower grade. However, the problem with these guidelines is that the symptom status is notoriously subjective in severe AS. Also, the decrease in LV ejection fraction usually occurs at a late stage after the LV has developed irreversible damage. Thus, aortic valve surgery in patients with reduced LV ejection fraction is associated with higher operative risk and worse postoperative outcomes. Thus, there is a need for imaging biomarkers to detect LV damage before it is irreversible and thus make timely intervention possible. Uh, this is the process of uh, how aortic stenosis progresses and LV decompensation develops and the imaging modalities that can help visualize the stages in this process. As aortic stenosis progresses, LV hypertrophy and interstitial fibrosis develops along with cell death and replacement fibrosis, which lead to diastolic dysfunction and then systolic dysfunction and heart failure. The symptoms and reduction in LV ejection fraction occur only late in this process. However, cardiac MRI can image the extent of myocardial fibrosis before the symptoms develop. And also, global longitudinal strain assessment with speckle tracking echocardiography can find LV systolic dysfunction before overt dysfunction by LV ejection fraction. So, thus, these imaging modalities are useful for detecting LV decompensation before the onset of overt symptoms and heart failure. First, the speckle tracking echocardiography can be used to measure global longitudinal strain which is a sensitive marker of LV dysfunction. Thus, it is useful in asymptomatic severe AS patients with preserved LV ejection fraction. Reduced LV global longitudinal strain was associated with increased risk of symptom development and also mortality. However, the limitation of strain is that there is a lack of standardization between vendors and that there is an overlap in values between healthy and diseased states, which makes it difficult to establish a cutoff value. Uh, 
Reduced LVGLS was associated with increased risk of symptom development and also aortic valve intervention. Also, even patients with normal LV ejection fraction showed worse survival if they had impaired LVGLS. And these patients showed no difference in survival with patients with impaired LV ejection fraction. Thus, the LVGLS can be used to discriminate high-risk patients within patients with preserved LV ejection fraction. Results of a large-scale meta-analysis also supported the association between impaired LVGLS and poor outcome, especially in patients with normal LVEF. And cardiac magnetic resonance imaging can directly image the fibrosis and scarring of the myocardium. Myocardial fibrosis can be categorized into diffuse interstitial fibrosis and focal replacement fibrosis. This diagram shows the composition of the myocardium consisting of the cells and the matrix. In the matrix, there is fibrosis and also focal scar change. With the CMR, late gadolinium enhancement vi visualizes replacement fibrosis, in other words, the scarred myocardium, while T1 mapping and ECV visualizes the whole extracellular matrix. LGE is a marker of replacement fibrosis, which was validated with histology in previous studies. Once established, LGE accumulates very rapidly and aortic valve replacement can arrest the development of further LGE, but it cannot reverse the already established LGE. LGE is an important predictor of all-cause mortality, even after AVR. And all LGE patterns, either non-infarct or infarct LGE, were associated with birth survival. This suggests that AV replacement before the development of significant LGE can be beneficial. T1 mapping on CMR is useful to image the diffuse interstitial fibrosis in the myocardium. Native T1 can be measured on MRI without the use of gadolinium-based contrast agents. However, there is substantial overlap between diseased and healthy states and T1 values can be affected by technique and field strength, which is a barrier to be used in multi-center studies. The native T1 was correlated with a degree of diffuse fibrosis on histology. An increase in native T1 was associated with worse clinical outcome, both before AVR and after AVR, and also regardless of whether the presence of LGE. The extracellular volume fraction is calculated using native T1 and post-contrast T1 values of the myocardium and the blood pool, and also the hematocrit. Conceptually, the ECV corresponds to the extracellular matrix and is a marker of diffuse myocardial fibrosis. The calculation of ECV potentially corrects for differences in T1 values caused by different scanners and sequences, and thus is a more robust parameter that can be used in multicenter studies. To calculate ECV, concomitant blood sampling for hematocrit is needed. Higher ECV values were an independent predictor of mortality. After AV replacement, well, uh, this is the replacement fibrosis and this is diffuse fibrosis. After AV replacement, while replacement fibrosis does not regress, you can see that diffuse fibrosis is observed to regress over time. Currently, many randomized controlled trials are ongoing to investigate whether early intervention is beneficial in asymptomatic severe AS. And most of the studies enroll all comers severe AS patients. Uh, one of these trials is the EVOLVED trial, which is enrolling patients with LGE on CMR. And the, risk, and the results will show us whether risk stratification with CMR will be useful to, to decide whether early intervention in asymptomatic patients with severe AS is beneficial. <laughs> 
Multimodality imaging techniques can also be used to detect comorbid disease in aortic stenosis, specifically cardiac amyloidosis. Recent studies are showing us that there is a high incidence of hidden cardiac amyloidosis in severe AS and should be suspected in patients with low flow, low gradient AS, excess hypertrophy, low ECG voltage, higher troponin or anti-probe MP levels. One recent study showed that 13% of the patients over the age of 75 who were referred for TAVI with AS had ATTR cardiac amyloidosis, according to bone scan results. Uh, TAVI improved outcomes in severe AS patients with ATTR amyloidosis as well. To detect cardiac amyloidosis in AS, CMR and bone scintigraphy are useful. On CMR, cardiac amyloidosis is associated with typical LGE patterns of marked myocardial enhancement, either subendocardial or transmural. Of course, there is a wide variety, and some patients, especially with early amyloidosis, may not show LGE. T1 and ECV values are also prominently elevated in patients with amyloidosis. And here are uh, some examples of LGE patterns in amyloidosis. You can see patients with no LGE and also patients with subendocardial LGE and also patients with uh, transmural LGE throughout the whole myocardium. And this is the same. You can see subendocardial LGE and whole transmural LGE uptake. The bone scintigraphy is, is a very accurate modality to diagnose transthyretin amyloidosis. 99 technetium-labeled bone avid radio tracers are used. Currently, three types are in use, PYP, DPD, and HDP. To note, MDP is often used in bone scans but has low sensitivity for cardiac amyloidosis and is not recommended for this purpose. Any cardiac uptake on bone scintigraphy was over 99% sensitive and over 86% specific for ATTR amyloidosis, with false positive almost exclusively limited to ALL amyloidosis in one study. Thus, bone scintigraphy is becoming the diagnostic test of choice for ATTR amyloidosis. The degree of cardiac uptake is usually graded semi-quantitatively using the perigyny score of grade 0 to grade 3. Grade zero is no uptake. Grade one is mild uptake less than the rib. Grade two is uptake similar to the rib. And grade three is strong uptake more than the rib. Also, the uptake can be graded in a quantitative score in contrast to the rest of the bone. In planning the TAVI procedure, the CT is the gold standard for the assessment of the aortic annulus, root, aorta, and peripheral vasculature for access. We no longer use the TEE for, for pre-procedural planning in our hospital. And I'll show you an example of how the CT is used for TAVI planning. This is an ECG-gated thoracoabdominal aorta CT angiography scan of a patient with severe AS. You can see the whole aorta in this scan, and also the, each of the femoral arteries for peripheral access. The abdominal aorta and the aortic arch are inspected in detail for any significant stenosis or calcification. Next, the aortic annulus is measured. And then the LVOT is measured. And the aortic valve calcification is assessed. You can see a calcified chunk in the NCC. And then the coronary heights are measured. The ST junction is measured. And the best valve implantation angle is planned according to the alignment of the heart on the CT. You can see the recommended angle is around LAO30. All of the above information is summarized in this table. According to these measurements, uh, the Sapien 3 valve 23 millimeter size is recommended for this patient. And alternatively, the Evolut Pro 26 millimeter size can also be used. 
and then the peripheral vessels are checked again to see if there is any stenosis and any, any expected problems with the valve passage. Lastly, the diagnosis of severe regurgitation is sometimes difficult to make by echocardiography. In this case, you can use the CMR as a complementary modality to quantify valvular regurgitation. The phase contrast velocity encoded MRI, which is abbreviated as, as VINC in our hospital, is used for this purpose. One point to keep in mind is that the cutoff values for severe regurgitation are different for echocardiography and CMR. The CMR-derived regurgitant fraction cutoffs are lower. You can see that the cutoff is around 40% for severe regurgitation in CMR compared to 50%, which is usually used in echocardiography. In the phase contrast MRI, slightly different techniques are used to measure regurgitant fraction for AR and MR. In AR, the regurgitant fraction is quantified directly through through plane phase contrast analysis at the, at the sinotubular junction level. On the other hand, in MR, the LV stroke volume is calculated from volumetric analysis, and then the aortic stroke volume is measured from through plane phase contrast analysis. And then the regurgitant fraction is calculated from these values. So today I show you the use of multimodality imaging in valvular heart disease, mainly aortic stenosis. The DSC and the CTAV calcium score is useful for the diagnosis of severe AS. The sodium fluoride PET-CT is useful for predicting AS progression. Speckle tracking echocardiography and CMR are useful for risk stratification of asymptomatic severe AS. CMR and bone scintigraphy can provide the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis in AS. And in planning TAVI for AS, CT is a valuable modality. And uh, where echocardiography is inconclusive in valvular regurgitation, CMR is a valuable modality. And thank you for your attention.